All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started with the panel this afternoon. My name is Sue Washer. I'm president and CEO of AGTC, an orphan ophthalmology gene therapy company. Um, and the panel this afternoon is going to talk about gene therapy, traditional gene therapy, not gene editing. We're all traditional gene therapy people here. And what it means about moving to the next generation of gene therapy products and processes. And I, first, I'm going to have the panel members just introduce themselves briefly. Donna? Um, Donna Armentano. Um, I'm uh, the Executive Director of External Science and Innovation at Pfizer, and I look for opportunities to fill both Pfizer's pipeline with respect to therapeutics, as well as um, new technologies to advance gene therapy. David? Dave Kern. I'm co-founder and CEO of 4D Molecular Therapeutics. Hi, I'm Sheila McHale. I'm the founder and current CEO uh, of Asbio, Asclepius Biopharmaceuticals is the full name, but most people know it uh, as Asbio. And I was the former uh, co-founder and CEO of Bamboo Therapeutics. Hi, I'm David Venables. I'm the CEO of Simpromix. And I'm Tom Walton. I'm the uh, Chief Business Officer for Logic Biotherapeutics. When I was asked to be on the panel, I was actually the Chief Business Officer for the Gene Therapy Program at the University of Pennsylvania. So even though my current company is gene editing, they still let me uh, sne sneak <laughs> onto the panel. All right, so I'm just going to give a kind of a brief overview of how we're going to go about this topic, because certainly this topic is something that we could spend, you know, the whole entire afternoon on and many of the advances that have been made across a wide variety of things. Um, but how we thought of it is that there are different components to the gene therapy product, whether that's which vector you're selecting, which serotype or capsid of that vector, what promoter, the gene cassette, formulation, manufacturability of your product, um, testing of the products sc or screening of these components, and then how all those fit things fit together. And there's been advances in each of those areas over the last several years. Um, several of us were talking about the fact that maybe some of us got selected for this panel just because of our longevity in the space. Um, some of us can remember Generation Zero, which is a, a little bit scary. I look a lot younger than I am. Uh, <laughs> so uh, where we're going to start then is to think about in some of these top areas, and I think that many people know there's been a lot of advances made in both capsids and promoters, but we're going to make sure and delve into the other areas that might not be so prevalent in your mind, You're like how people engineer the gene itself and the gene cassette. Um, how people screen all these things that they think look better in a mouse to make sure they're going to look better in a human clinical trial. Uh, and so we'll take you through some of those topics. And after we talk about a few things, we're actually going to come out to the audience and we're going to ask you, what are some things in this space that you think new technology needs to be applied to? What are you struggling with? You know, what are you looking at and how, how, how are you using new technology so that we can respond to things that you have on your mind. So I'm preparing you for the fact that, that we will be asking you questions, okay? So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to have um, kind of in, or, in, in no particular order, uh, Sheila, David and David, who are, you know, Sheila's flanked by the two Davids, uh, talk to us about the advances that have been made in designing both capsids and promoters, which are two of kind of the most common parts of a vector that people know about and think about. So David, you want to start and you can just go down the, down the line there? Sure. So I'll uh, speak to capsids. So as you know, most uh, groups in the field use uh, one of 10 available serotypes, AV1 through RH10, which were basically discovered as adenoviral contaminants or uh, out of, pulled out of monkey tissues. So these are really not optimized pharmaceuticals. And so at 4D, what we've tried to do is apply something we refer to as uh, therapeutic vector evolution, to use the power of evolution to generate novel capsids. So the idea is to overcome some of the hurdles we've seen with the first generation capsids. These would be uh, things like getting better efficiency in terms of delivery, using the clinically optimal uh, route of administration to target the tissue you want to target. Uh, overcoming pre-existing antibodies in the, in the human population, which can be an issue with some of these serotypes. 
Uh, and then also with a more efficient vector, you hopefully will get less off tissue, uh, off target uh, exposure, which means less of an immune response and hopefully lower cost of goods on the manufacturing side. So um, that's something that we do by generating a massive library of on the order of 100 million different capsid variants and then applying natural selection to identify the optimal uh, capsids within that pool. So that's just one example of an approach to getting next generation capsids, which can overcome some of the hurdles we've seen with the first generation capsids. And Sheila, I know that you guys also play a lot with capsids and engineer them as well. We do. Uh, very similar to 4D. We redesign the capsid in order to increase trophism, uh, avoid pre-existing neutralizing antibodies, etc. I think maybe where it's a little bit different, uh, we don't at this point uh, use natural selection. We have some information about the various aspects of the virus. So we know, for example, what different loops do and uh, we know what different receptors do. So I'll give you examples. Uh, our 2G9, those are our neural tropic vectors. Um, they have two receptors. They have both the receptor of AV2, uh, which is heparin, and the receptor of AV9, which is glactin. And this dual receptor vector essentially allows us to target particular tissues in the brain and then within those particular tissues get good spread. Uh, Pfizer got rights to some of those vectors as part of the bamboo transaction. But we also have other vectors such as 2I8, and the I stands for an inner loop that we have taken from uh, 8. And so we use the backbone of AV2 and we put in the loop from uh, 8. And that particular vector has high tropism for the heart but it detargets the liver. And that allows us to go in with higher doses for the heart, which would increase the effectiveness of heart therapeutics. Uh, we're taking that into the clinic uh, in our Nanocore spinoff, uh, and that will be used for heart failure. So our IND has been accepted, and we've uh, completed uh, pig studies for both ischemic and non-ischemic heart failure, which look very positive and means we can treat both uh, systolic and diastolic heart failure. So those are just some examples, but we have a whole portfolio of different vectors that have unique uh, tropisms. And like David and the rest of the industry, we're also working on repeat administration and uh, are conducting some uh, very uh, important non-human primate studies uh, to see how those vectors are performing. So now switching over to the promoter side of things, David. Yeah, so we're, we're a promoter company and um, um, my, my sense is that traditionally and classically in the industry people have, have got the gene into the cell but really at that point lost control over it. It's a bit like, like landing a module on the moon and once it's there not, be, not being able to control it or talk to it or influence it in any way. So the approach that we've taken is to say, well, the days of just using CMV or CBA or endogenous promoters is, is gone, and now it's about starting to think about rational design of the most appropriate expression system and how you can use that to increase safety, increase efficacy, and really improve the design of, of, the, of the gene cassette. And, and so, so we use a, a rational bioinformatics-based machine learning process to develop promoters which are totally unique in sequence. They don't exist in nature. And typically, in, in our first generation of what we do addresses one of three things. One is around size. So we create promoters that are, that are so small, about 200 base pairs, that increases the packaging capacity of the vector. So you can start to think of delivering larger genes. But then starts to focus on things like being able to design promoters to a particular strength of expression that's required for the gene of interest. So rather than just relying on, the, on an endogenous CMV that gives you no subtlety or no, no options of control, you start to think of well, some genes you need to be expressed strongly, some genes you need at basal level, so you can create promoters that are specific um, to that. And then the final one is really doubling down on what we've heard around capsid tropisms and saying, well, let's make these promoters specific to the target cell type of choice, so make them liver-specific or neuronal-specific or muscle-specific. So let's um, maybe add uh, Tom into this discussion about promoters and talk about you know, the different ways. You know, Sympromix has one way of doing it. How have we screened these promoters um, uh, uh, traditionally? And then if, if David and Tom can kind of have a conversation with each other about are we getting close to the time when we really can turn genes on and off? Sure. And is that additive? Is that, is that something we want to do? And are they not leaky anymore? Because we've had problems with that in the past. So David and Tom, why don't you kind of sure. um, take so, that so, on? 
So I'll kick off, and again, you know, talking mostly to the experience that we had over Penn over the last two, three years. Obviously, the, the gene therapy program there led by Jim Wilson had a big focus on um, new vector, capsid design. Uh, AV8, 9, RH10 were uh, identified from tissue samples, as David says, in, in the lab at Penn. And, you know, I think of, uh, you know, been very significant in terms of the development of the field to date. Most of the work that we did in promoters was really just using um, promoters that Jim Wilson felt were, were tried and tested that he'd used over a number of years. Um, so there was a lot of work focused there on optimization of the cassette, starting to develop next generation AAVs. But when it came to uh, you know, actually starting to work with synthetic promoters, it wasn't a space that we did so much ourselves, and it was certainly, you know, a lot of discussions with uh, David and trying to understand what Symphronics was doing there. We felt that had a, a lot of promise. I think part of the challenge that, that we saw was, you know, when you go to this brave new world where you have some, you know, new design capsid, don't necessarily have a lot of experience of how that's going to behave moving from mice into NHPs, uh, synthetic promoter, uh, you know, some codon optimized, hyperactive transgene. When you put all of that together, uh, really knowing what you have is quite complicated. So I think a lot, a lot of the discussions that we, you know, we've certainly had over the last few years are around the analytics, and I think a lot of the work we were doing there and Symtronics was focused on in the promoter space was around you know, really understanding whether it was using machine learning or other forms of analytics to understand you know, how that construct was going to perform uh, in vivo and from species to species. When I think about regulation of gene expression, there's two areas which I think are very interesting, and the first we looked at a lot at Penn, the second is more of a focus for Logic Bio, my new company. So with traditional gene therapy, obviously being able to deliver the transgene, and then whether it's just having some basic you know, ability to, to turn off that gene, a kill switch, and that's certainly of interest as we move from you know, tackling rare monogenic disorders potentially into you know, delivery to the muscle, using that as a stool to create a, an antibody. Uh, having some ability to turn that on, turn that off, is going to be critical. The other area which we think is very interesting, which we're focused on in Logic Bio, is actually promoterless. So al almost the opposite mm. <laughs> of the, the approach that Symprox is taking, where we d deliver the transgene and it takes a, a ride off of an in endogenous promoter. And I think the, the area there which is really interesting at the moment is you know, really starting to understand all of that cell-specific machinery in terms of promoters, enhancers, you know, a lot of the, the non-coding regions of the genome and how we can harness that and how we can use that to regulate gene expression. And you know, that's certainly a new, a new space, but one which I think is very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And David, how, th how close do you think we are to having a really good kill switch? Very close. <laughs> so, uh, no, I find this area really exciting, and, and I think the last ARM event I was at, actually, there was um, uh, Olivia Danos and Jim Wilson doing their fireside chat about the history and what's been happening in gene therapy over the last few decades, and um, I think Jim was asked about what's the future and where's it going, what are the needs of, of the future, and one of the things he said is, it used to be, it used to go to ASGCT and other events, and people would always talk about um, inducible promoters, and that's all d totally disappeared. Wouldn't it be great if inducible promoters came back and we, we had a, that tool? And um, so all I can say is that Sympromix, we have created inducible promoters that have really tight control, and these are promoters now that are small, they're only two, two to 500 base pairs. They can be turned on and off by either a small molecule or by a biological trigger or an environmental trigger. And so the day now of, of being able to deliver a gene and control it when it's in the body and um, being able to turn it on and off is, is here. Um, the other thing that we've done is take it one step further and say, well, what about logic gates and, and control algorithms? So we've got promoters now that are actually induced. You need two inducers um, to turn them on, so it's an AND gate. Um, so obviously a lot of people discuss this in the CAR-T space where you need to regulate for on-target, on-tumor effect. And so we're building the toolbox that enables these, type, these types of things. So uh, yeah, I find this area so exciting. There's so much going on. I'm, I'm lucky to have a team of um, some amazing scientists coming out and, and developing these types of technologies. So Donna, the other major component of a vector is the gene itself. 
uh, how you optimize that gene. We hear a lot about codon optimization. We hear a lot about you know, creating more stable genes so they're manufacturable. Uh, but there's a lot of things that go in, into that. So speak to us about what your thoughts are about where, we're go where we've been, where we're going with optimization of the gene itself. Yeah, I think um, you know, there's uh, a couple of things that we think about with respect to gene optimization. Obviously, the, the one that comes to mind is codon optimization. But people are also paying attention to CBG content um, and worried about you know, stimulation of an immune response. So that's another um, aspect to at least the gene part of it, the design. I'd just like to echo what um, folks have already said about promoters. I mean, when you think about it, when um, we started doing gene therapy, we thought about layering on that possibility of the gene regulation. And the problem with some of those older systems um, were that you weren't really off in the off state. And then when you were on, there really wasn't a good um, dose response. There, you didn't really get that nice breadth of um, expression. It wasn't really that titratable. But I think there's a lot of um, emerging science um, that's not necessarily focusing on the promoter, but looking at other ways to tweak gene expression. So we've seen a couple of examples in the literature um, where people are attaching um, protein destabilization domains to their transgene as a way to target them for degradation and then stabilizing them in the presence of a small molecule. Um, another approach is to, and, and this is to target gene expression, not so much from the promoter level, but post-transcriptionally and post-translationally. So another concept that is emerging is um, the concept of putting an optimer in your messenger RNA so that you can control splicing and regulate that, regulate your gene expression that way. So I think um, it's, an, it's a very exciting time. We've got a lot of different tools to draw upon in the toolbox. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how expression cassettes continue to evolve over time. So we've got all these tools. And we're trying to figure out how to screen these tools and, and pick them. And you, know, you can't screen for every tool independently. You can't, and you certainly can't screen every tool in a non-human primate. None of us have enough money to do that. Um, so Sheila, why don't you talk about some of the ways you guys have approached um, screening and what you think the appropriate pathway is and the animal models, et cetera, to do so? Well, it's probably going to sound surprising to a lot of people, but the first consideration we look at when screening different tools and different capsids, et cetera, is production. Can we produce it, and can it be produced in a scalable system? Um, that is always key for us because we're looking at what's going to be required for commercialization. So um, a lot of times we ourselves had vectors that had incredible attributes, but we couldn't produce them. Or if we put them with self-complementary, right, we couldn't produce them, whatever. So that's our number one uh, criteria. Is it producible at uh, high yields? Uh, we have a pretty good production system, our Pro 10, which now produces 10 to the 17 at 200 liters. So we know our system's good, and <coughs> we can't produce our vectors or whatever, our combination of gene vector and promoter in the system, then we know that's just not a therapeutic that we can, combination that we can advance. So that's the number one thing. And then animal models. I mean, everybody in this space gets frustrated because the animal models are not predictive. I mean, that's just the reality. It's very uh, difficult to take what you see in rodents and say that's going to be translatable into humans because time and time we've been tricked. Um, we saw that ourselves in the early days of Chatham with hemophilia before we switched the Padua gene. Um, what we saw in, uh, in the rodent model, we expected we were going to get outrageous expression. Uh, when we went into the dog model, it didn't translate. And then, um, you know, based on our experience uh, with uh, Chatham, with the Padua gene, what we saw in the clinic didn't translate. And so the animal models, unfortunately, are not very linear in their predictability. Um, but you still, you have to find the best animal model that's out there. Um, you have to use it and take the data. And um, 
I mean, my perspective, maybe it's a little bit of um, a realist perspective. I still think there's a jump when you go into the clinic. Um, there's you holding your breath and you just hope <laughs> that the large animal data uh, predicted what you hope you're going to see. So that's been my experience. And then, David, at, at 4D, when you're screening through all these, these capsids, what, what models do you use and how predictive do you think that the animal models are of what you're going to see as you, you ramp yourself up? Right, so I'd say when it comes to the actual discovery piece, we do all of our in vivo discovery in non-human primates for obvious reasons. So we see huge differences in terms of what you get out of a screen, out of a, a mouse or a pig or a, or a non-human primate. And um, so we've elected to focus on non-human primates for obvious reasons. Uh, for the ex vivo uh, selection and say in the presence of antibodies, we always use primary human serum and primary human IV immunoglobulin. Uh, to make sure we're getting things that are resistant to, to the human uh, antibodies in the human population. Um, once we've identified a, a lead vector, we then uh, look very closely at the patent situation. We look at product, uh, production, so it has to package well. Fortunately, part of our discovery effort uh, mandates that these vectors are packaging well along the way in the packaging cell line, so that's not been an issue for us. And, um, and then in terms of validating these and comparing them to the control uh, wild type vectors that others are using, um, that we do in vivo in non-human primates, uh, either with a GFP or an intracellular gene or a secreted transgene, if that's of interest. Uh, and then we have a very robust human cell and a disease modeling group where we use the best available uh, pluripotent human stem cells to generate uh, human organotypic models of lung tissue or retinal cells or cardiac ventricular cardiomyocytes, for example. Uh, so we think that's an important step to de-risk these vectors before we take it into the clinic. So they have to be able to deliver in vivo in a non-human primate, but they also have to be able to uh, transduce at a level that's highly significantly superior to controls in the best available human target tissues. Um, and again, part of that is we also look at off-target tissues to see how, how specific this targeting is. And then finally, um, we do screens for uh, sensitivity to human antibodies in the population is the final part of our screen. So we feel that that hopefully de-risks it as much mm -hmm. as we can until we get into the human situation. So another part of this is, you know, what are some of the, th what are some of the opportunities that these new technologies might these new tools, these advances in the tools might help us with. And maybe Donna and Tom, kind of bookending the group here, can, can talk about why do we need these new tools? What are some of the, the issues that we're trying to overcome? Sure. So Donna and then Tom. Yeah, so um, you know, if you think about um, the primary focus of many gene therapy, um, gene therapies that are under development right now, you can think of them in terms of simple gene replacement, where um, you have a pretty large therapeutic window, meaning that um, you, you can get a therapeutic effect with a pretty broad range of, of expression. Um, but I think you're going to need um, tighter gene regulation, appropriate gene regulation, for um, disease indications where gene dose is very critical. So for instance, um, Rett syndrome, right? If you have too little, you have Rett's, but if you have too much, you have a, a different disease. And um, I think the same is also true for Angelman syndrome. So I, I look at these advances in being able to tightly regulate and titrate. I think titrate is really the, the key here. Um, titrate gene dosage so that you make sure you're um, targeting your therapy into the right therapeutic range. Okay. Tom, what are your thoughts? So I guess I think about this in terms of three different areas of opportunity. The first is, you know, as we started to discuss new tissues, so a big focus on capsid engineering to increase uh, tissue tropism. And you know, what I think we've seen is a progression in the field over the last few years from, you know, I don't know, you could call it low-hanging fruit. I don't think anything's easy here, but certainly the, the liver and, and eye diseases where we know the, the vectors can, uh, can target into CNS, starting to see some you know, incredible results now coming back from companies like Avexis and uh, you know, Voyager and Parkinson's too, so very different types of diseases. The next area is you know, different indications, and as I mentioned earlier, one of the 
you know, areas we were very interested at Penn was moving away from you know, the rare monogenic disorders that was always going to be a big focus, starting to look at using um, liver and muscle as a, almost like a drug factory to produce an antibody. We even, the, the most advanced program what we had there when I moved on was actually in a, a f influenza, so a very different approach, you know, a gene therapy for flu, not something I would have uh, thought about when I came into this field relatively recently, only three years ago, but using a vector to deliver a transgene that encodes for a broad uh, antibody against seasonal influenza. So I think you're seeing you know, a real variety of indications now and then finally new populations. So it could be you know, the ability to move into a, a pediatric population, um, whether you're taking a, you know, an integrating approach or you know, looking to re-administer. Um, and I think when you look across the, the spectrum there, it's pretty phenomenal what all of these different technologies could, could mean. Again, a lot of complexity, a lot of ground to be made up, um, but it's very, very exciting. If I could add to that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, w w what I think about is safety, right? Because once you deliver a gene therapy, you, you can't withdraw it. And so I think having the technologies that enable us to titrate or even just, you know, to, to have, to withdraw it in the sense that you turn off expression, um, enable us to maybe start to consider gene therapies for diseases where the etiology of the disease is still a little bit obscure, but we need to at least um, uh, take a shot at a therapy for those patients that have really nothing. Mm. And so it gives you an opportunity to try maybe a, a therapy that's a little bit risky, but knowing that you could turn it off if you needed to. Okay, so I warned you that we would be asking questions of the audience, and you've now had 27 minutes to, to think of your question. <laughs> so Sarah here has the uh, mic and uh, is ready to pitch it to someone who has a question for us about these new technologies and advances in tools in gene therapy. Come on, you're all smart people. You can think of a question in 27 minutes. <laughs> And I'll hand it to you, or I'll get close if you need it. Not, not a long pitch here. Over here? Where? I'll make a start then. Um, so you have very well described all these uh, tools which are available and coming along and in early stages of the development, and then also the sophistication which comes in when you take that into uh, production and clinical development and what a big transition that point is. So um, on the one hand that is uh, uh, the, the very innovative uh, approach of uh, packaging ever more novel tools and regulatory and promoters and all of that into these tools and on the other hand uh, it is more the pragmatic approach of let's deliver something which uh, works in the clinical setting. So uh, how do you think all these new tools, how do they uh, I mean, is it realistic that we, in the foreseeable future, see that coming into fruition and uh, to clinical development, or do we have to separate the two things and be a bit more careful uh, in terms of what we actually propel forwards towards uh, clinical trials? So I'll take a, a stab at framing that, um, and then I'll probably pitch it to Donna mm -hmm. and Sheila to, to um, talk a little bit more about. And so, you know, I think that the issue is is that, you know, in many cases, we can't use the tried and true, and the tried and true first generation tools actually didn't work in the clinic, and so we're using these new tools to enable us to have better success. Um, and I think it has to be built upon showing safety in the best animal model that you can put together before you move it to the clinic. But Don, I'd be interested in your opinion from Pfizer's point of view, looking at all these new tools that are out there, and then Sheila as somebody that's moving <coughs> some of these new tools into the clinic. Sure. Um, it, it's undoubtedly going to be a, a less clear path forward because you have, you have so many components going into the design of your your therapy, then you have to know that 
if you're regulating something by a small molecule, that that in itself has to, is going to have some a safety package associated with just the small molecule alone. So um, the, just from a development standpoint, it becomes more complex. Um, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to do that. And Sheila, how do you try to set yourselves up the best possible before you move it into the clinic? Um, well, I think the combination of different elements, um, and some of our design, we're facing that now for some of our clinical trials, and um, our first approach is always to do it simple. Get in the clinic, have fewer variables, because if you have too many variables, there's just too many things that can go wrong. And so in our approach, we've tried to get the most, like the least risk, uh, risky path forward, and that is fewer variables. So, for example, we have a strategy for repeat administration. Um, we would not put that into our therapeutic design to advance something into the clinic as the first pass. Maybe in the 2A, we would include an arm that would have some patients that would have uh, be part of that particular regimen. Um, and so I think, I think you want to simplify things on the first path. You know, you, like David said, you do go into non-human primates. You lot, have a lot of information about biodistribution. You know how things perform, but there's still a variable. I mean, there, there just is. And I think you want to not introduce more variables um, and have more things that can go wrong. And so, I mean, that's been our approach. Just keep it simple to get in the clinic, get the human proof of concept data first, and then you can complicate things with a second generation product. Now, sometimes that's hard to do if you're racing for you know, orphan drug designation, and sometimes that race wants you, it pushes you to do things maybe a little bit more quickly, but we just are like Donna, right? Safety for us is the primary concern, and so we, we tend to be a little bit more cautious in advancing things into the clinic. So David, you have a comment? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, you, you can develop all of these tools and it becomes a great playground and a sandbox to play in and come up with all sorts of novel ideas and a lot of those will obviously go nowhere, but then you come across some instances where it, it really is driven by specific need and I can't say in too much detail, but we're working one example at the moment where the, the genes being delivered in, into the brain, if that gene gets expressed in the wrong cells, the, the mouse are dead. If it's expressed in the, in the right cell, then the d disease is uh, ameliorated. And so to come up with a synthetic promoter that's highly tightly regulated only, and only active in the target cell is going to mean that that disease becomes treatable. Uh, and so there's a very clear route to benefit there. Um, I think then when it comes to Donna mentioned about, so the small molecule induced promoters that, that we're developing here, then yes, you, you essentially end up with, with the gene therapy regulatory process and potentially the small molecule NCE regulatory process. So what we're thinking of uh, doing there is, is essentially repurposing already approved drugs. So something that's already been through the FDA approval ideally is off patent and then we can repurpose that and create a promoter that's induced by that. And what we've been able to show is that we can actually create promoters that are dose responsive. So you can start to dial up and, and, and dial down effect as well as turn it on and, and, and turn it off and, and have that dose dependent effect. And that's a huge safety benefit from that because obviously when you do your initial trips, um, clinical trials, you don't, what dose do you need to deliver? And once you've gone in with a low dose, you're done. And so you can't go back and then, and then treat again. So if you can then go in with a maximum um, safe dose from, from a, a vector perspective and then dial up or dial down the, um, the efficacy based on the small molecule inducer, it provides another um, really useful tool that, that, that we're developing. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Ready? Uh, so, my name is Ramon Salsas from UPenn. Uh, one of the dimensions that has not been explored is the, in, the upper limit of the packaging capacity of AAVs. So, if your disease has a transgene that is larger than five kilobases, uh, then you, you may be out of luck. So, um, are your organizations working at all in that direction, or are you aware of any efforts in, in that direction that are worth mentioning? So we actually prepared for this question, and, and I didn't even plant it. <laughs> so Donna, why don't you start? Um, so there's, um, I, I know that there are, are several um, investigators exploring alternative uh, capsids, such as those derived from Boca virus, that have a slightly bigger 
um, packaging capacity, but those vectors really give you maybe about an extra 500 base pairs or maybe a little bit more than that. So, you know, real estate is at a premium mm -hmm. <laughs> in the AAV vector. Um, I know that there are other investigators that are looking at their payload and trying to determine which regions of the payload can be deleted. So in other words, they're making um, deletions in CFTR, for example, or in the case of Duchenne, right? Uh, we're not delivering the full dystrophin gene. It's a mini dystrophin because we're putting in what can fit. Um, there are other strategies, too. Um, and that really depends on creativity and finding perhaps a parallel or an alternative pathway that could be regulated in place of the gene that you want to, tra to, uh, to replace. So I think that's one way to get around it, but again, that requires a lot of research and investigation for those parallel pathways. There's also several groups looking at breaking up the gene into two pieces um, and coming up with different creative ways to make sure that they recombine on expression um, in, in the right way. And so, uh, and people are going about that uh, a variety of ways. And I think they've had some success. There's been some su success published in various animal models that that is possible. It does add complexity because you're going to manufacture two different vectors and test two different vectors and then mix two different vectors and deliver them. Um, and controlling whether both vectors get into the cell or not um, creates some complexity. Uh, but this is a, a, an area of research that people are having to be pretty creative about if they, if they want to go after a gene that um, doesn't fit into AAV. Of course, the other option is to use a lentivirus or to go to a completely another vector. This obviously has been a fairly AAV-focused discussion, but issues of serotype and promoters and gene design and regulatory elements apply to whatever vector that you're using. Um, you might not have a capacity issue, but certainly you want all these pieces in a lentivirus, an adenovirus, a, a herpes virus to be um, optimized. I, Any other I think we, we shouldn't no. ignore um, activities and focus on non-viral delivery systems as well. I mean, we're, most of us are probably virologists and have lived viruses all of our lives, but I mean, to, to address a capacity issue, if the non-viral system could really come through um, strongly, I, I'd be hugely interested in, in, mm -hmm. in that and progress in that area. I would area. say there's been a, almost a resurgence of non-viral delivery yeah. emerging. Yeah. Another question. Mark? So I wanted to ask panel uh, two questions. One is in terms of uh, constructing and designing a expression cassette. Uh, so far, all these AAVs are actually made using either triple positive transfection or baculovirus uh, expression systems and all of that. And there is an antibiotic resistant gene typically used in these expression cassettes. What are your thoughts about using non-antibiotic resistance uh, solutions uh, going forward in this new, uh, new era? That's the first question. And second question is going to be about potential impact of this, all these new initiatives, really from the manufacturing perspective. In other words, would, would these advances have any downside on the manufacturing side? In other, in, specifically speaking, would they drive need for new analytics, for more analytics, for more complexities in the manufacturing environment, and things of that nature? Thank you. So I'll take the second question, um, and then let's see, maybe uh, David and, and, and Sheila maybe can, uh, and, and whoever wants to address the first one. So the second question about, yeah, I think Sheila touched on this earlier, certainly some of these new technologies and new tools absolutely directly affect manufacturability. And that's one of the ways Sheila mentioned she uses to screen out, you know, yeah, it may be very specific, but I can't make it, so it doesn't, it doesn't pass. And so we have to continue to work at capsid design and promoter design because it has to be manufacturable. That's absolutely for sure. And then on the, the question of you know, um, manufacturing methods that have the antibiotic um, issue, there are methods now that people are using that don't, don't have that, um, that, that problem. And whoever else wants to comment I'm on not that? I can speak to that. I mean, they, they obviously don't want you to use, the FDA doesn't want you to use ampicillin resistance, so we use canamycin resistance, and it seems like 
that's so rarely used clinically that everyone's fine with that. Is that your experience, Donna? Well, yes, that, that is. But I would also add that um, there um, are alternative systems that could be used where um, the antibiotic resistance genes are deleted. So it's a question of using alternative sources of DNA. You know, that's not something that this panel was really set up to do, is to talk overly much about um, manufacturing. Uh, but it is, it is considered part, I mean, that certainly regulatory agencies say the process is the product. Um, and so all of the advances that we've talked about with tools, you, can, uh, you have to apply all of that kind of thinking and pressure to manufacturing as well. And you have to think of it from the end game. What is the regulatory agency going to need for you in your BLA? And try to build all of that in as soon as possible. And so questions about antibiotic resistance factors, questions about um, characterization, char questions about what scale do you need for commercialization, all of those things need to be applied. And we could have a whole, as you know, Mark, we could have a whole separate panel just on the manufacturing issues. Yeah, just um, so we've been developing our toolbox of, of, of promoters, inducible promoters, and one of the main drivers of that is to be able to create stable producer cell lines um, so that um, obviously the toxic genes you put under the control of an inducible promoter and you can start to regulate, get the stoichiometry of expression of the different genes appropriate and more like the wild type to, uh, to basically get that balance of expression and the time of expression right. So our aim is to, is to be able to develop an AAV and an Alenti and a retro um, produce, stable producer cell line and then take that into suspension and do what the monoclonal antibody guys do and go up to 10,000 liter bioreactors would be great. <laughs> <laughs> he has great goals. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have Tom, why don't, why don't you talk about, because um, I know it, you, in, your, in your work at UPenn, you worked on, they, that you and Jim worked on both promoters and capsids and how to pick them. Mm. Uh, one thing that we haven't maybe focused on enough yet is, you know, you have a choice of a capsid, you have a choice of a promoter, you have a choice of how you design your gene. Do you do all that independently and then push it together at the end and go? Or does there have to be some trying different combinations? Yeah. Are, or are they independent decisions or are they uh, dependent decisions? No, that, I think it all comes together. And again, you know, I think the benefit that we had at Penn and the last time I was on a, a panel, I think at the Washington meeting, it was around a, a translation. So more, to, you know, taking the technology, the capsids that we had fairly considerable experience with, the promoters and how do we you know, deal with the manufacturing issues, deal with scale up, etc. So, you know, I think our approach there was very much to focus on using that toolkit that we had in a you know plug and play approach. Jim, obviously, with you know significant experience you know, in terms of tran translation into different species, you know, would have a pretty good idea of you know what that construct was. You know, the optimal capsid, um, you know, promoter transgene selection. But having said that, you know, his view was until, you know, until you put that total construct into an NHP as well, even in a mouse, he you know, didn't really believe, you know, into an NHP, you really don't know what you have. So we did a lot of work around you know, optimizing of different constructs within HPs before we would choose a final you know, candidate selection to be able to progress forward. Um, so it's bringing it all together and then you know, screening that, that construct. Right. So with the idea that once you pick a promoter, maybe you need a different kind of capsid to optimize the delivery in a specific cell type. Or, you know, yeah. in our world of ophthalmology, if you pick subretinal injection or you pick intravitreal injection, what capsid and promoter you want to use in those two different delivery methods might completely change. And yeah. so you'd have to optimize again when, if you tried to change delivery methods. That, I mean, that was exactly, and he, he once explained it to me in, in very untechnical terms. He obviously realized my can complete lack of uh, technical knowledge um, as it's like spaghetti. So you're trying to connect all of these different pieces together and you know, until you put it all together and then put it into an HP, you, you really don't know what you have. Uh, even if it's something where you have a pretty good idea of the capsid, how that's gonna perform in different tissues. Um, so again, you know, highly complex and then trying to manufacture that, you know, a lot of experience in manufacturing certain capsids, but as we, you know, we change the payload, change the promoter again, that, 
that so it's an is. iterative process of making sure that the different components that you've selected through different methods actually work together in the best animal model that you have. Correct. And then there's dosing too, which is very complicated. So even if you're getting into the right target tissue, the dosing is another factor. And that is in itself, I think, another difficult situation to deal with. Other questions from the audience? Oh, behind you, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dave O'Dowd from <clears throat> Draper. <clears throat> and uh, it's sort of directed to Sheila, but really everybody. And maybe it's a little micro for the panel. But in the, in the context of screening and, and the, the ability of getting predictive models, a lot of people are working on in vitro models of human tissue, um, single scale, multi scaled. Um, what are your thoughts on that and, and where it is and where it needs to be in order to be useful for you? We had, uh, I'll make a, a yeah. comment in that we have generally found that many times, at least for AAV, doesn't AAV work. doesn't work the same in culture yeah. that it does exactly. in the whole, uh, whole intact. So right. screening in culture for AAV generally won't give you, won't give you the, <laughs> the right answer. But yeah. I don't know if you want to expand on no, some specific examples. <laughs> yeah, we learned this probably like 15 years ago when we did a lot of work um, on heart tissue uh, for the program that we're bringing into the clinic now. It just, it, it didn't work. It gave us totally different results or it just didn't work at all. We got no result. So the plates, is something about the plates that they don't, it, too, if you use anything on a plate, it has problems. So we just, we don't do any in vitro testing. Oh, maybe comment on that. I think it completely and totally depends on the expertise of your team and on the, exp the quality of your human cell, right? So there are a lot of things that are called, you know, human cardiomyocytes, but they're probably fibroblasts and, and have very little to do with an in vivo cardiomyocyte. But if you work with, you know, a top pluripotent stem cell expert who knows, you know, 20 different markers to look at, and, and as in addition to functional assays for that particular cell type, I think you can derive uh, useful data, and as you might expect, we get completely different results if we do it in that sort of a organotypic system versus something that someone calls a, a cell line um, that is a particular target tissue. So I think it really depends on the quality of your reagents and your team and how many different phenotypic and functional markers you've looked at. And but then there's I, probably not off-the-shelf cells. That you definitely not off. <laughs> definitely not off the shelf for sure. And then I think anything that's more three-dimensional, uh, organotypic, is probably going to give you better predictive value than something that's a cell sitting on plastic. But it, but I think also um, in vitro you don't have the same barriers that exist in vivo. For instance, uh, you may screen for a certain cell type, but your virus is going to see all the cell types in the body. So how would you know if it's specific? So in a sense, you know, the way I view um, the cell screens is that there may be, um, once you have a lead identified, it's really more confirmatory, right? If you are doing a screen in an animal, but you just want to double check and make sure that it also transduces a human cell, it's really more confirmatory, I think. Yeah, and I think we, my we, we view it the same way. I think it's necessary. If you didn't see transduction of that highly optimized target cell, you'd probably think twice. Yeah. But it's absolutely not sufficient because in vivo there are additional barriers on top of that. So. Another question? Nobody on this side of the room has had a question. <laughs> poor, poor Laura hasn't been able to throw her cube. <laughs> <laughs> You started talking a little bit about non-viral delivery, and I'm thinking now about ex vivo. Are, are there learnings that you believe could be, could read through from the work that you're doing in viruses to, for instance, construction of messenger RNA molecules that might uh, for, perhaps increase durability or length of expression? I didn't. So that. That was Doug. I think that's Doug, isn't it? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, he was asking about are there things that we've learned from the viral world that you can apply? And we talked a little bit about non viral work, but can you apply it to the ex vivo um, world? Right? 
I think that this no. uh, crew doesn't have the ex vivo experience <laughs> to, to respond to that. <laughs> You've managed to stump us. <laughs> well, I, um, you I guess oh, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, in a sense, yes. I mean, so a lot of the um, sort of the gene expression technologies are actually being developed for ex vivo modified stem cells. So the, if you think about the CAR T space, right, there's a lot of gene regulation and or uh, gene expression, modulation of expression, whether it's at the promoter level or whether it's a dimerizer to bring two um, functional groups together. Um, so I, I actually think both fields will be learning from each other going forward. Did you, Doug, did you mention something about mRNA stability for persistence? Yes. Yeah, I thought I did. Sorry. And durability of expression. Yes. Yeah. Like, so that. About non-viral delivery methods. Yeah. So that that's one, a particular aspect of the expression cassette that we're starting to look at increasingly. So it's not just about the promoter to boost the strength of expression, but then how long does that mRNA uh, hang around for, and how stable is it? And so thinking about synthetic introns and other other elements that we can start to design into the expression cassette. So, yeah, it's something we're we're starting to um, to think more about. Uh, I couldn't claim that it's an area we've got any great data on just yet, but hopefully next six months. So I'll, I'll pose a question to the, uh, the team. This isn't one that we talked about it a little bit on our, our prep call, but didn't really formulate a, a question around it. But it's the whole issue of, this, of the immune response, the antibody response we see many in many of the trials, the inflammation that some have seen. Um, and how do the new tools that we've got, how, how are they being helpful or being thought to be, be helpful there? And maybe, Tom, if, if you'll, you'll start with that, um, sure. and then we'll, others can jump in. Yeah, so I guess that there's a number of ways you could deal with that. And you know, as David was saying earlier, you know, trying to design the capsid so they can evade the immune system. Um, at Penn, we had a big focus you know, less on the, you know, rational design or, or shuffling more on tissue sampling, but, you know, not taking tissue, uh, you know, from human or the typical NHP species going into rare exotic species, trying to find new, you know, capsids in polar bears and, you know, areas <laughs> like that where probably they've had no exposure to humans in the past and, you know, to, to avoid the immune system. The other approach is obviously taking some kind of you know, small molecule approach, trying to dampen down the immune system for a period of time uh, to enable you to deliver the, uh, the virus or, uh, you know, re-delivery. And, you know, then the, the final approach, I guess, which is slightly different, but, but deals with the challenge you could have a re-delivery is, you know, what we're focusing on with more of the, you know, sort of integration so that you might not have to do the re-delivery if you see the, you know, dilution at an effect of time trying to go in, um, you know, early into, say, pediatric populations and, you know, trying to actually integrate the, the transgene so it replicates and you don't have some of the challenges you would have with the re-administration. I see those as three, three potential approaches. To and Sheila, you mentioned that you'd been, you guys have been thinking about re-administration. So right. how, how do you think about the possibilities of re-administration and, and, and does that initial antibody response go down over time and you can re-administer or, or what are your thoughts about how you guys are, are handling that? So we have two approaches that we're looking at. One is the use of a small molecule in combination with our um, factors. <sighs> Another is redesigning the vector, but not the capsid. It's a pretty unique way of doing it. We still think that in an ideal world, it would be a product in a vial, right? Not a protocol, not a procedure, um, nothing extra that you have to add in, in an ideal world. And so that's where we're trying to get to um, at this point in time. Um, and so, you know, it's yet a lot of work yet to be done. We have to, we're testing it right now, non-human primates, and we'll see where it goes. So uh, an, another question I had, we talked a lot about um, promoters, and we talked a lot about, you know, being able to control the expression over time by using a small molecule or using a biologic. Does the addition of something that the patient is going to have to take on a more regular basis does that take away one of the big advantages of gene therapy that we all talk about, the durability of expression, the one-time treatment? Yeah. How, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Maybe we'll start with David Kern. 
can I answer the immune response question? <laughs> <laughs> um, seriously. Um, no, I think I, on that, I'll, I'll leave it to the rest of the panel. But on, on the immune response thing is, again, we, we have the ability to uh, evolve the vectors in the presence of human IVIG to try to get vectors that don't cross-react with the pre-existing antibodies. And then for redosing, uh, one of the approaches we're going to take, we don't have proof that this works yet, um, but one of the approaches we'll take is to immunize uh, animals or even get you know, serum from patients that we've treated and then use those antibodies to screen our library again to come up with vectors that are not cross uh, sensitive to the same antibodies in the population to be able to repeat those. Um, you know, in, in, in terms of your question, I, I, think, um, I think it depends. I think if you're treating a terminal disease and you need tight regulation and it requires you to take a pill every day, I think people will be okay with it. Um, so I think it just depends on the severity of the disease and how necessary that titration is. What do you think? David, I think you, you, you seem yeah. like you had a response. No, I think it's, it's disease specific. I mean, I can see some diseases, as it was mentioned earlier, where you wouldn't want to have the gene continuously on. And, and I find the whole in vivo um, antibody production, so turning your muscle into, a, into an antibody factory, that you need to have that on in the event of, of an episode and then um, turn it off when that episode has passed. I think there's a number of diseases where that's appropriate. Um, so I, I think it's disease specific, indication specific, and I, I think now we're starting to think about different classes. So we're enabling the, the development of different classes of, of, of therapies for different types of diseases, and for some it will be appropriate and some it won't. But I, I'm sorry, I think as well it's, you know, it's a question of, you know, it could be a, you know, a patient going into a hospital for a weekly, monthly infusion, IV versus uh, it's a small molecule, you know, a tablet that you can take at home. So I think that's potentially a significant benefit from the patient's perspective there. As well, it may be a question of also having a, you know, consistent level of expression versus, you know, the sort of peaks and troughs that you can sometimes see with that type of administration. So if you can, you know, somehow regulate that, again, there could be a, an efficacy or a safety benefit that that approach could have. But I agree if you think about a, a one and done and then all of a sudden you're taking a, <laughs> a weekly treatment, it does seem strange, but I think there could be significant benefits to, to that approach. And then what about, is it, should it be on all the time and you have to take a pill to turn it off? Or should it be off and you have to take a pill to turn it on? And what are the safety implications there? Donna, you want to? I'm not throwing questions at them that, I didn't, that we didn't prepare for. <laughs> so I'm being a little unfair, but they're smart. <laughs> Donna, you want to? Uh, well, how would I think, Pfizer think about that? I, I would think, um, at least from my perspective, um, you'd want to have it off and have the small pill, turn, a you know, small molecule turn it on, or some other biologic to turn it on. Just from pure safety, because you wouldn't want yeah. to have to depend on the person remembering to take the pill exactly. to keep it off. Right. Okay. All right, we've got two more minutes. Is there, is there someone else who has a question in the audience for the, for the, the last two minutes? Okay, not seeing a question. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pose to, I'll, I'll just pick on, on two of you. Maybe I'll do uh, David Venables and uh, Tom, just at the end of the, end of the. What do you see, if we, had this same, if we had this same panel in the future, five, 10 years from now, what would gene therapy, what would be the kinds of tools we would be using and what would be the things we'd be talking about that had been revolutionary to the space? Who wants to go first? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off. Um, so obviously I think the future is gonna be all about uh, promoterless and um, <laughs> nuclease free gene, gene, genome editing. Um, but no, I think, I mean, I think we're going to see an evolution. I think what we're already talking about in terms of these next generation technologies, you know, they, they could, you know, have a significant step change. But I think one of the benefits is that, um, you know, we're kind of evolving what we've done in terms of the previous generation of viral vectors and promoters and making them better. So I think it's going to continue to be an evolution of what we've seen here different payloads, you know, depending on the disease indication, I think you're going to see a, a variety of technologies from classical gene therapy to genome editing, perhaps you use CRISPR for this disease, uh, you know, the kind of approach that we're looking at for other diseases. So I think you're going to see, you know, much more of a, 
you know, a broader array of technologies coming to the marketplace. And as I said, some complexities around that, but a, a big opportunity. So my blue sky vision is that we're heading towards the, the ability to generate and deliver genetic circuitry. Uh, so to move away from the monogenetic disease and start to think about pathways that need to be re-engineered. And they may be endogenous and boosted or adjusted endogenously, or they may be total de novo pathways that have to be um, inserted and, and delivered. And that, I mean, the delivery system is going to be a big question when you get to that sort of size. So will artificial chromosomes come along and, and probably non-viral systems that we, we need. But I mean, you think about things like diabetes or, or pathway diseases where you really need to going to have to deliver an orchestration of multi-gene cassettes and the interplay of those various elements is going to be key. So from my perspective, I see Symprome is, is developing the tools that will start to enable that future view of what we products could look like. Great. Well, thank you for that, that vision. And thank you guys for the and, uh, interactive discussion and being willing to answer questions we didn't even prepare for. <laughs>